presenter is Ro Vertigo from Queen's University. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, the introductions. Um, I'm presenting um, a piece of work we've been doing over the last uh, year or so uh, called Holoflex. Uh, it's a flexible holographic smartphone with a uh, light field lens uh, array and a flexible uh, PLED uh, touchscreen. Uh, I have a prototype here with me. Um, if you want to have a look, it's pretty hard to see from, from this distance, but uh, feel free to come after the session and, uh, and try it out, or come to the demo session tonight. This work is mostly uh, that of Daniel Gotch uh, and Zhu Ying Zhang, uh, to my students with help of my postdoc, J.P. Uh, Karaskel. Uh, unfortunately, Daniel couldn't uh, be here due to other obligations, so I'll be presenting the talk. This is in a uh, now 12-year-old uh, tradition of uh, building what we call organic user interfaces. Uh, these are interfaces with non-flat displays. And we now have the actual screens to do this. And we can actually conform these screens to uh, different shapes, um, like we did with Magic Wand, which was present presented at Kai this year. This is a cylindrical display, so it's a rigid display. And organic user interfaces don't have to be paper-like. They don't have to be flexible. Um, but um, uh, more um, uh, in, in February, we, uh, we showed one of the first uh, full-color um, FOLED smartphones uh, called Reflex, and um, videos of these are all online on our website. Um, organic user interfaces were very much born on a, a, a trip to Tokyo um, exactly 10 years ago when I gave a keynote in the other room and um, discovered this concept of wabi-sabi, which is a very Japanese uh, design notion of what they call imperfect beauty. And so um, I believe that uh, we can design computer systems that are much more sophisticated than the rigid flats, uh, flatland shapes that we're using and have been using for the last 50 years. And the goal is to design UIs that, like origami, allow for natural shapes and therefore for more uh, expressive uh, features in terms of human emotional communication. Um, so one of the questions is why are all our user interfaces flat and rigid and why do they not have a third dimension? Well, as we've seen in, uh, amongst others, the first talk, uh, virtual reality headsets are all the hype in startup land today. Uh, but this is an image from the previous hype cycle, which was in the 80s. This is uh, Scott Fisher's uh, system. And you know, one of the things that hasn't changed is we, we're doing some really interesting things to the face here, and particularly in terms of blocking the real world, but also uh, in terms of um, not being able to be seen by others. And this is not necessarily a future I look forward to. Uh, these systems suffer from heavy tech requirements. They're bulky, uh, particularly for AR. Head registration needs to be really, really fast and really good. Poor field of view and poor resolution. Um, and so there's a great need for 3D displays that actually solve these problems, that provide stereoscopy and motion parallax but live in the real world and in the context of the real world. And that's what we're trying to do. And we call these real reality interfaces. So uh, what we've designed is a light field display. And a hologram is a form of light field. So the term hologram isn't exactly accurate, but that's what people know. Um, and these preserve not just the intensity of a light ray, but also its direction. Um, now, um, some techniques for creating light fields include uh, the use of uh, large retroreflective projector arrays. And what's cool about them is that they are very high resolution, but they're very expensive and very bulky, um, as well as parallax barriers in some previous work presented by um, Placencia at uh, Mobile HI 2013. Portalax was a retrofitting 3D accessory for a smartphone that featured a parallax barrier uh, in combination with face tracking to provide 3D features. Um, parallax barriers have also been used in Nintendo 3D, um, but um, that was only for stereoscopy. Um, so some of the more recent implementations uh, use a different technique, and that's the microlens array uh, to create light field displays. And this is actually a very old technique, uh, originated in 1909. Um, but um, that's the technique we chose to use. But before I get there, this is what a parallax barrier does. I'm not sure if you can see it. But we have here uh, rays emanating um, out of a scene. And um, with luck, I can show you this. The left image here, uh, we see that we can trace that to the second column, and the right image here traces to the first column. And then as we move, which is the motion parallax, uh, this just becomes n columns. Okay, so this is how we can create not just stereo images, but we can also uh, create motion parallax. The problem with parallax barriers is that while they are very, very easy uh, to, to build, 
uh, they darken the screen quite a bit. So we chose for a micro lens array, which instead spread the light. Here we place a lens over a block of n by n pixels. Um, each pixel is then sent in a different XY orientation, as you can see by the rays coming out of this pixel block. Um, and then each pixel block is really the view from a pinhole camera um, that is uh, filming the scene, so to speak, uh, at a virtual location XY in the, uh, in the 3D scene. Um, now, there's been a lot of work on this. Uh, Hirsch, uh, in 2009, used a light field display for both uh, display and capturing 3D content. So these, these could potentially work both ways and act as a camera or an optical sensor. Um, in 2013, Hirsch uh, implemented a display that reacts to incident light sources. And uh, Tomkin, in 2012, demonstrated using a light pen how he could provide input to a system. And I believe we had a similar demo um, at WIST last year. Um, now, the problem with prior work is that none of these systems are particularly portable. And so what's cool about this is that it's very thin film and, uh, in fact, flexible. So here we see the view of a pixel blocks and how it's rendered. So what we're seeing here is a top view. In the, in, the, in the top left, we see the 2D image of a tetrahedron. But on the light field, it's actually rendered quite differently. So we see here blocks of 12 pixels wide, so eight, 80 pixels in total. Uh, acting as a pinhole camera, and that's how we render the scene. So we literally have, in this case, 16,640 virtual cameras ray tracing this scene back into, uh, into the, uh, the light field. Um, so we set out to, port, uh, to build a portable light field uh, using these micro lenses, and um, because a lot of our work deals with flexible displays, we just decided to make it flexible as well. So here we see those micro lens arrays, very, very tiny. So each pixel block consists of uh, 80 pixels. Um, it's a circular image of the um, uh, entire scene from a particular virtual camera located at an XY location. Um, and this approximates a 2D array of pinhole cameras with, in our case, a 59 degree uh, field of view. Ideally, we would have fisheye lenses, but they're very hard to manufacture at this small size. To calculate the direction of the array that corresponds to every specific pixel, we determine first the position x, y of the pixel uh, with respect to the closest lenslet. Um, and we then apply rotations to the y and the surface normal to determine the direction of the ray coming out, uh, going back into the scene, which is what we do with the reverse ray tracing algorithm. Um, and that's how we determine the luminance and color of that uh, pixel. So the hardware is um, relatively straightforward, actually. It's a micro lens array. It's a 3D printed flexible plastic lens array um, of our own design uh, with 16,640 lenses, giving us a resolution of 160 by 104 pixels. Uh, the lenslet are, are printed on a flexible, flexible optically clear substrate that's half a millimeter in, in thickness um, uh, with a distance between lensless centers of 750 microns. Uh, around the lenslets, and this is quite critical, we printed a, a black circular mask. And what this does is it fills the space between the lenslets, making sure that there's no bleeding um, and separating the light field pixels block from one another um, so that at extreme angles you don't see them. Um, then in order to minimize the moiré effects, uh, we chose the spacing between the micro lenses in a way that does not align uh, with the underlying pixel grid. Uh, so we rotated it a little bit uh, about half a degree in order to uh, be able to, um, to avoid any kind of interference patterns. Um, then underneath that is uh, a multi-touch sensor, and this is a 1080p sensor, um, again, thin film and flexible, uh, on top of a 1080p um, OLED that, um, that is flexible and that has a resolution of about 403 dpi. With these screens, higher resolution is better uh, for light fields, and we're hoping that we can get to the 4K and 8K screens, uh, which are being driven by virtual reality headsets. Um, so we need really, really high resolution uh, screens, but uh, this one's only a 1080p. Um, and then we have an Android board um, and uh, some flexible batteries from our own design. These are basically PAL batteries that are put together. Now, uh, some of this stuff gets really tricky. When you start bending a display, um, this causes an unintended distortion um, of the light field um, of the displayed rendering. And so we had to correct for that. And our model assumes the curvature of the display to be approximately cylindrical when bent. Now, we have a bend sensor uh, in the device in order to, bend, uh, in order to sense that, um, uh, that curvature. 
And this is also used uh, as a means of uh, input, which I'll get into in a bit. Um, so we estimate the cylindrical uh, radius on the basis of the bend sensor readings. And then when ray tracing, the direction of each ray is calculated on the basis of the surface normal that originates from that. So the curvature radius R for pixels corresponding to a lens at the position x, y is used to estimate the origin of the ray. And that's how we uh, are able to calibrate for that. Uh, we are using some empirical constants in there. Uh, the paper gives more detail as to how we determine those. Um, so um, we also have a shift between layers. And this is very subtle, but definitely notable. Um, and this is unintentional, so we'd like to correct for that as well. Uh, the lenses shift outward in relation to the pixels in the x direction as you bend the display. And we corrected for this by enlarging the pixel block uh, spacing associated with the lenslet along the x-axis, again using uh, an empirically determined uh, constant k-bend. And again, you can read more about that in the paper. All right, so um, this is what, uh, what it looks like uh, when you use bend sensors uh, for, uh, for input. What's really neat about this is that you actually get this sort of integral movement uh, you get the X, Y from the multi-touch, and then you can actually press into the screen uh, to do the Z. And it's a very, very natural interaction technique. Um, so here we're using uh, multi-touch for positioning a 3D object uh, in Unity 3D running on the phone. This is, again, a tetrahedron, and this is also our experimental task, which I'll get into in a sec. Uh, so we're seeing that tetrahedron move forward and backwards, but the camera can't really show that. Uh, because the camera is, uh, is, is not stereoscopic. So that's why it, it looks blurry, but it isn't, it isn't when you experience that. Um, so the user study was, uh, the, the purpose of the user study was to evaluate the performance of bend input um, in this kind of task, uh, as opposed to other means of Z input, and we chose the Z slider um, as a means of, um, of input for comparison. Um, and... Um, um, we were translating a 3D object. Uh, this is a task that was defined by Shuman Jai in 1997. Um, and uh, we've already seen our first condition. This is the second condition. This is the touch slider. And this is less integral in our opinion. Uh, you have to sort of move with the thumb, uh, the, the touch slider, to move the object in the Z dimension. It's, it's a bit less intuitive, we thought, than the bent uh, input technique. Um, so subjects were asked to touch a 3D tetrahedron-shaped uh, cursor, which we see here in white, and then align it with three dimensions with the position of the 3D tetrahedral target, which we see here in blue. Uh, we used it within subject design with two conditions, bent versus set slider. And in each trial, a 3D target was placed randomly on four positions equidistant from the center of the screen. Um, and then we had four positions along the Z axis as well, um, up to about two centimeters uh, depth. Uh, yielding 16 possible target positions, which were then repeated three times for 48 measures per condition. And we measured movement time and Euclidean distance to target uh, as an error. Um, our hypotheses were that bend input significantly improves movement time over the Z slider, but that the accuracy does not differ significantly. Results confirm this, and as we see here, um, movement time was indeed significantly faster, uh, about 24% faster in the bend condition, um, while the distance to target trended uh, to be less accurate um, for the bend condition. These were, in fact, not significant differences. So there may be a little bit of a movement time accuracy trade-off going on here, and it might be interesting to follow this up with a Fitz-Law study, but it's kind of hard to do these kinds of studies in 3D with bend gestures. Um, bend input was ranked uh, significantly more physically demanding than that slider, but uh, there were no other uh, significant differences between questionnaire items in terms of the qualitative uh, analysis. All right, on to uh, application scenarios. So there's some interesting application scenarios we can think of for this device, and they utilize the flexibility of the device as a means of input, but also as a means of transforming the holographic experience by being able to shape the display into uh, whatever the shape of the object is. Now, while our experiment graphics were run entirely on the phone, the following videos were not done that way. We made a VNC uh, tool that um, uh, showed renderings from a computer because rendering high-quality graphics 16,640 times just wasn't possible on the GPU. So the first one is uh, really physical gaming. So here we, we took uh, the Andrew uh, Birds game and used bend input uh, to power the slingshot. This is a very intuitive uh, thing. And what's really cool is that the passive haptics of the display of forces really match very well what you're doing with this game. Uh, and of course, also, the, uh, the bird actually literally pops out of the screen when you do that. 
Another one is uh, holographic teleconferencing. So what's cool here is you can actually shape the display uh, to be the shape of the face, and now you can actually look from the side of the face, and you can have multiple viewers see different sides of the, of the face. Um, so we used a point cloud from uh, Connect 2.0 to render 3D um, images of the remote person, um, giving onlookers different views of the remote face. Um, so here we see that. So here we just see a flat version of the point cloud, but it is, this is stereoscopic, and there is motion parallax. But now the user is starting to bend the display, and we actually change the point cloud rendering so that it's sort of smeared along the display, and you can now actually look, literally look around it on the display, which is pretty, pretty neat. And then finally, we implemented a simple 3D editing tool that allows users to move objects around uh, in Unity 3D, uh, such as the handle here in this teapot, being able to actually edit 3D objects in a very intuitive fashion. All right, uh, takeaways. Uh, we implemented an interactive flexible light field display uh, with 160 by 104 uh, micro lenses um, with bent input. And um, this system preserves 3D stereoscopy and motion parallax without glasses or head tracking. Um, ray tracing algorithms rendering 16,640 views can be run in real time on the GPU of the phone if the graphics are simple. Uh, and bend input does appear an efficient technique for Z input compared to touch sliders. Um, now, before um, we end the talk, um, this is our demo tonight, so uh, why don't you uh, come to the demo room and uh, try to play some guitar with our uh, bendable phone. I'll be having fun with this all night. Thank you. Really good talk. Um, I, my only question was, um, so in your estimation, how miniaturizable is, or like how high of resolution can you get on a micro lens array um, now or like two or three years into the future? Like is this something that could become HD in, a, in the near future? I'm, I'm gonna point to my slide. Oh. If I knew what I was doing, I wouldn't call it research. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, we are working on 4K versions now. Um, but making these micro lens arrays, uh, we, we haven't done that at 4K resolution yet. Um, it's, it, it's pretty hard. This was already tough to do, so I don't know. But we're trying. Um, uh, you talked about using um, pressure to move something back in the Z direction. How about moving something forward in the Z direction? How would right. you do that? That's a very good, yes. Uh, sorry for not mentioning that in the talk, but what you do is you actually, you pop the screen back like so. So it's like, it's almost like a squeeze gesture. And you can pop it back and forth. Any questions? I actually have a question for you. So to what degree can you really bend the phone? To what degree? Yeah. Um, like I can comfortably bend it like that. Not much further. At some point the, at some point the phone breaks when you do that. <laughs> and we, yes, we have broken a lot of phones. <laughs> for me to, to try after, after your talk, see? Yeah, sure. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.